All right. Let's get remembering to get the <laughs> get the recording started here, as if someone would want to watch this again later. Anyways, uh, come on, let's get going. Come on, come on. There. Enough of the timer. My name is Jim Davis. I'm a regional marketing engineer here at Fluke Networks. I've been working with Fluke Networks about 18 years, so 17 and a half years of time in South America. So again, I'm always a surprise to be presenting in English. So what was the question of what material we should put together for people? And we spent a lot of attention, a lot of time and attention talking about fiber. It's kind of new and exciting and so uh, some interesting changes going on there. But we can't forget our good friend copper because Copper doesn't hold still, and there's a lot of copper installed there, and people are looking at how do we take advantage of the copper that we have out there? What can we do with the copper that's already installed to make it work better? That was always the promise. If you followed the standards, your, the road that you installed, if you will, would support other vehicles. So we want to look at some new link definitions, some new things that are happening. And one of the main reasons that we see people installing copper today has to do with its ability to conduct power. And we want to talk about some of the measurements that are specific to power over Ethernet installations. I want to talk about this N base T phenomenon. I've been getting more and more questions, people saying, hey, really? I can put two and a half or five gig on category five cable? Yeah, let's take a look at how that works and what we can do. I want to touch on category eight. It feels like it's been out for a while, coming up on uh, coming up on a year ago that the TI approved the standards for Category 8. I want to make sure that everyone is familiar with what Category 8 is. I know there's some sayers of nay who will go, ah, oh, do I really need Category 8? I've never heard anyone asking me for less. This doesn't mean you have to install Category 8 tomorrow, but good to know where we're going with that. Finally, I want to talk about results management. We talk a lot about our testers and how we capture test information, but we also need to talk about what we do with that test information once it's captured. Let's dive into it. So this is, <laughs> I think, the newest and most exciting thing going on in cabling. Hard to explain uh, when I'm at home with the family. Ah, kids, look, MPTL, and they go, really, Dad? Gosh, where's that been all my life? But no, there is. Uh, a new model to complement the channel and permanent link that we're familiar with, something called a modular plug terminated link. Uh, actually I actually had to write that down on my whiteboard to help me remember it. So what is a modular plug terminated link? As we know, the standard says you absolutely positively have to put a faceplate on the far end, a patch panel on the near side and a faceplate on the far end. That's just years of experience talking. People who have not put on a patch panel or who have not put on a faceplate have just crimped a connector onto the far end of the cable and they go, yeah, that was a good idea for a few minutes until the tab broke off. I had to re-terminate it. It didn't work out right. It was tough. But, but we need to differentiate here when we're talking about structured cabling under somebody's desk. That structured cabling under somebody's desk, structured cabling that's going to the printer, Absolutely, we want to use a faceplate all the time. That's what makes it structured. And we know that not putting a faceplate on the far end, it's kind of a recipe for disaster. So please, let's uh, remember we really want a faceplate. We really appreciate that administration point down the road. But today we're putting some new devices on the far end. We're seeing people who may install a camera on a far end, or uh, we'll get back to this picture again, but. Uh, this is a hotel room that I was at, and we see the cable coming out of the ceiling here, and the cable just has a, an RJ45 plug crimped right onto it. Now, they're not putting a faceplate up there because it's hanging from the ceiling, and it's not a typical point of administration. Yes, we're hanging a wireless access point there, but we're not anticipating installing a printer there in the future or a coffee maker. No, it's probably always going to be a wireless access point. So if we're going to use this model where we have a jack on one end and a plug on the other, is this a permanent link or is it a channel test? <laughs> we got channel on one end and permanent link on the other. So the consensus is we really want to test this to the permanent link limits. They're a little bit more stringent. And in the future, when we add a patch cord uh, to the patch panel side here, we won't need to retest. Now, 
what is this modular plug terminated link? Here I've got a bundle of cable, and you can see on one end there's a jack, on one end there's a plug. So here's our patch panel, and here's the plug on the far side. Now in this hotel they happen to have crimped on a little RJ45, uh, some nice bend radius here. It would be a challenge to get a regular RJ45 crimped on to support what we're looking for. There are several manufacturers who have been working on these field installable plugs that will meet category 6A specifications. Now we know that the recommendation when we're going to access points is to use category 6A cabling. We'll talk about that some more as the presentation goes on. But starting to get ready for this with these field installable plugs. And again, it's just a model where I've got a patch panel on one end and a plug on the other. So we've seen the writing on the wall that in the next revision of the NCTIA 568 standard, the D revision, they're going to incorporate this modular plug terminated link. So we'll have a permanent link adapter on one end. Now on the far side, something a little bit special here, we're not going to use our regular channel adapter. We're going to use a patch cord adapter because if we used a channel adapter, we would not include the mated next from this connection here. Now, in order to include the mated next, in order to measure, we'll certainly look at the termination of the plug. We'll always look at the termination of the plug. And some of you have had the experience with the channel adapters, and they say, hey, there's a, a bad patch cord there, even though we're not measuring the mated next to the plug. But in the case of this link, we are going to be looking to use the special patch cord adapters. Now, these patch cord adapters have a special jack. What's special about this jack is the performance of it is known. We're not taking just any jack and putting it out there. We're putting a specific jack with specific electrical performance. Now, some people compensate a little bit more in a plug. Some will compensate a little bit more in the jack. So you get jacks that are rated as high or low relative to the next. This is supposed to be a centered jack. So it will work well with both types of plugs. But yes, you will need one patch cord adapter to put on the far end. Uh, we see this used in, in surveillance video cameras. We want to send more power out to those so that they can focus, so they can move and change. And we're going to get 90 meters for this model. Now, will this be acceptable for a warning? process. Maybe not, because we're starting to veer away from structured cabling. There's a, a lot of, I hate to say emotion, uh, experience in the standard. People are going, no, we really, really want to put a jack on the far end. So before you, uh, before you recommend this model to a customer, check and make sure with your manufacturer if they will still warranty that installation. So we've decided that we're going to be using uh, copper because we need a power device on the far end. Maybe we have an access point, maybe we have a camera. Now one of the main reasons that we're going to use copper for this is copper can send power. I start talking about IoT, ooh, the Internet of Things. People go, oh, everything's going to be wireless and everything's going to talk to the Internet and everything will be connected. Great. There's certainly some fascinating changes that are going to come out. And that's nice that a lot of those devices are going to be wireless, but that means we're going to need a lot more wire because wireless doesn't work without wire. And we're going to want to supply power to those access points. I'm sorry, as, as bright as the light is that you can shine down a fiber today, it doesn't work real well for powering your remote devices. It can be done, just not too much power coming out there. When we look at the specifications for Category 5E, Category 6, and 6A, the field test requirements are just not as complete as we'd like to be. They're a standard. We don't get to write the standard. We contribute to the standard. We can make recommendations, but there are a lot of players there, a lot of different interests. Now, within the 568 standard, the cabling standard, and within the application standards, the IEEE, those would be the application standards, for example, how to run power over Ethernet, you'll see that they define a parameter that's called DC loop resistance and resistance unbalanced. So, now, even though these are defined, 
Remember, what's the standard doing? Standard is defining a road. The road has a lane. How wide is a given lane? Not how thick is the concrete, but what weight will that lane support? And then it defines, say, the height of the overpass. What's the lowest overpass? So anything you can fit on that road will run. Well, these DC loop resistance and resistance on balance are an important parameter. I won't call it the height of the overpass, but you understand the analogy. It is a feature. It's there. We need to know what it is. So the cabling and the application standards define it. However, the 1152, the A revision of the 1152 standard, talks about the test equipment, the accuracy of the test equipment, and what tests we're going to run in the field. And we see that loop resistance and resistance on balance are not mandatory. They're optional. They explain what the limits are and how to run the test, but you don't have to run them. So if you want those tests, you have to ask for them. So um, now, curiously, in the European standard, or the international standard, I'd say European standard because it's most often used over there, uh, also in Asia, I'm sure, but the ISO 11801 standard, it does require resistance testing, different from the TA. It's not an optional measurement. Here we have a list showing what those tests are and what are the tests that we're running. Basically, in addition to continuity and, and the length of the cable, we're measuring how much noise there is inside the cable, underneath the jacket, uh, be next and return loss, and then we compare that to the signal strength. How much signal are we measuring? How much signal is coming through? That would be the insertion loss. So we can compare the amount of signal with the amount of noise, provided we have more signal than noise, the system should work. Now here we're looking at what's required by the 560, the cabling system standards, and then what's required in the field testing standard. And you see that, no, nope, it's not mandatory to run the resistance or the resistance on balance. Hey, something to pay attention to down here on the bottom, power some alien crosstalk and power some alien fex testing. I know, I know, power some alien attenuation to crosstalk ratio far end. But you understood when I said alien fex. <laughs> Those are mandatory tests, and you do have to do them when you're running Category 6A and Category 8. So what is the resistance on balance? First, let's take a look at what the loop resistance is. Here we've got two conductors within a pair. And if we look at the resistance of one leg of the pair, and we look at the resistance of the second leg of the pair, and we combine those two values, we get the loop resistance. This is a value that's expressed in ohms. The higher the value, the more resistance, the more signal loss that we'll have, the more effort we need to put into our transmission. Now, that's loop resistance. Now, the resistance on balance is the difference in those two values. We want absolute values. We want the resistance for each leg of the pair to be similar, to be close. Now, why is that? It has to do with how power over Ethernet works. Here we're looking at a, a simple uh, PoE setup. I say simple because we're only using two pairs. We're not using one of the new high power PoE plus, plus, plus uh, solutions. I know too many pluses, but work with me here. Uh, we're not looking at one of the, the new high power solutions that would work, for example, on four pairs. But basically, what we're going to do is at the network interface card, little bail in there, and we're going to load in a signal right on top of the data. We can send both signal and data at the same time. So what we do is we divide the load, and half goes on one leg of the pair, and the other half goes on the other leg of the pair. Now, if the resistance of each leg of the pair is not similar, that's going to complicate our ability to send the signal out. And if it's particularly unbalanced, what we're going to find is that we start to get interference from the power load against our data transmission. Now, another thing that we want to look at is the resistance of each one of the pairs, because we're going out on one pair and back on the other pair. And if one of those two legs has a different resistive value, that's going to complicate our ability to take full advantage of the PoE and get the full signal out. Now, in addition to the loop resistance and the, and the resistive unbalance, the difference in resistance between each leg of the pair, we also have these fun new applications. Here's PoE Plus and PoE Plus Plus, 
where we take advantage of all four pairs. Now here we go. We're going to run a standard test. This is our standard CAT5e permanent linker channel. And our favorite measurement, resistance, letter I. Why letter I? <laughs> Why can't it be passed, failed, something I? What does this mean? Well, it's just an informative test because it doesn't count for pass, fail under a standard test. You'll notice in the limit there's no value listed. So we measure the resistance because resistance is an important electrical parameter of the cabling, but we don't apply pass, fail limits to it. Now, if we use an enhanced test, if we do one of our plus all tests, then we're going to apply the limit. It's 21 ohms for channel, 25 ohms for, I'm sorry, 21 ohms for permanent link, 25 ohms for the channel, and we will compare the measured value against the limit. Now, this is the loop resistance. We have the resistance unbalanced within the pairs, and then on the end we have this other value, the pair-to-pair -pair unbalance. That's where we're going to compare what the resistance is for each one of the pairs uh, using this trusty formula. It's too early in the morning for this much math, so we'll just jump forward here and say what we're looking at is a value of 0.2 ohms or 7.5% of the total resistance of the limit. So here in this graph, we're seeing for the different pair combinations, the variance in the resistance between one pair, between the one-two pair, and the three-six pair. Generally, when I'm doing this live, I have to hold up four fingers and I say, look, we're checking the interference <laughs> from one pair to the other pair. Uh, here in the webinar, you get the, uh, the old-fashioned actual pairs listed. Okay, so concern about a resistance for the sake of transmitting a signal, but there's another area where this kicks in. And more and more I hear about people warning me, saying, hey, be careful, there is some non-standard cable out there. Non-standard cable. What do they mean by that? Well, <laughs> as we're all painfully aware, our boss is real big on saying, how are we saving money? How are we saving money? Let's do that less expensively. Anytime you've gone to a customer and said, hey, I've got a great idea, we're going to install this cable, this jack, this patch panel, here's your cost, no matter what product I'm offering, it could be barbed wire, we know what the customer's going to say. Really? You're crazy. That's so expensive. Oh, lower the cost, lower the cost, too expensive, too expensive. Do they mean that it's really too expensive and they're not happy with the solution we're offering? <clears throat> no, not at all. They're just, you know, buyers are trained <laughs> from birth to say, too expensive, too expensive, and we get all worked up. Well, one of the problems is people get worked up and go, how can I make the cable less expensive? The cables, it's basically copper and oil, petroleum, that makes the PVC, the polyethylene insulation. So based on the price of copper and oil, that's what the price of your of your cable is going to be. Even sending it to be made in a low-cost region, there's just not that much labor involved. So somebody had the idea and said, well, does it have to be all copper? Because I could put aluminum or I could put steel in there, and those are less expensive than copper. They're still conductive. They're just less expensive. And because high frequencies travel on the skin, the skin effect, I'll put copper around the outside edge of the cable. It's brilliant, isn't it? Well, I'm sure there's a time and a place to use copper-coated aluminum, but communications cable is not the place. 568 and the 11801 standard clearly require that the conductors be pure copper. You're not allowed to put other materials in there. The resistance values cannot be met by materials that are not copper. They cannot be met by aluminum. They cannot be met by steel. And, well, this is a tricky thing out there. Let's take a look at this uh, cable here. Uh, looking at the printing on the jacket, and it says UTP, category 5E, four pairs, 24 gauge. Now, they're even honest here where they say it is copper-coated aluminum. One thing of interest, in the United States, the National Electric Code does not allow aluminum in communications cables, so this could not be a CM-rated cable. Let's see what else it says. Well, it says ETL verified. I'd like to have third parties verifying it, but it starts to break apart here because they say TIA-568C2, and for those who are paying uh, sharp attention here, we know that it's not EIA anymore. It's ANSI-TIA, but I'm likely to reject the cable because there's bad printing on it. 
Let's see what the fluke has to say. Let's see what the fluke has to say. Plug it in. Run your test. Well, this is a scary part for me. We're running a Category 5e permanent link test, and it's passing. It says it passes, right? It's good. Well, not quite. Look carefully at the resistance value here. Now, if we change our test to this plus all, what we're going to do is we're going to apply the other tests, such as the resistance and the resistance on balance. The TCL test, we'll save that for another day to talk about balance, but we're going to run the resistance test, and we're going to apply the limit from the resistance test. So this is the same cable. Look at this, 53.6 meters. 53.6 meters, same test. I'm just changing the limit. And now we're going to include that resistance in the resistance on pallets test. Now, in this case, 26 ohms of resistance on only 50 meters of cable. Too much resistance, fail. Let's get this out of here. So, anyways, moving right along. Talked about our resistance testing to make sure we're going to support power over Ethernet. Let's take a quick look at why we're going to be needing more power in our links. I'm going to talk just for a second about what's going on in the wireless world. Uh, today, very well implemented is the 802.11n specification. I think even most of our most of our smartphones, our, our iPhones, our Android devices now support 802.11n. And we're starting to see more and more of a rollout of 802.11ac. Down the road, we're going to have 802.11ax. Now, the reason I want to talk about these is they are the driver for this new N-base T. So real quick, 802.11 uh, improves the efficiency of the modulation over 802.11b, a, and g. We can use a larger channel, more antennas, and we start getting up to higher speeds. In uh, full, you know, the full nine yards, short distance, full MIMO, we can exceed 450 megabits with 802.11n. Is anyone really getting 450 megabits with 802.11n? No. But it's faster and it's more efficient. And now with 802.11ac, again, improved modulation, wider channel widths, and we start seeing faster and faster potential speeds. And with phase two, potentially more than two gig. Wow, two gig, there's gotta be some overhead. I don't bet I don't think we're gonna reach all that speed. That may be the case, but in an access point with multiple radios, we're starting to see that the bottleneck is not in the air, but the bottleneck is getting passed to the cabling. Because as we know, category five five E cabling goes up to what speed? Yes, it'll run gigabit Ethernet. So in the future, for new installations of access points, recognizing that each one of potentially multiple radios in the access point may be running faster than that gig speed, I really want to run Category 6A. And the recommendations are two Category 6A cables to each access point. A couple of reasons for that. One of them, typically the Category 6A cable has a larger diameter conductor. That's going to make it easier for it to send a power over the cable. It's also going to reduce the heating that happens to the cable when it's running these higher power over Ethernet. So new installations, both for the benefit of power over Ethernet and for the benefit of being able to run easily 10 gig and who knows down the road higher speeds, really want to run Category 6A cable. But I already installed all of my access points. My access points are there. I don't want to run new cable. Well, that's an interesting thought. Uh, just one more point, uh, the 802.11ax, it's just going to go faster. Uh, some, how are they going to do that spectral efficiency? So it sounds spooky if it'll come out on Halloween. But <laughs> funny to make this comment, hopefully all the Cisco people are distracted by the Cisco Live event that's going on. One of the things that's driving NBase-T in addition to these additional speeds is Cisco doesn't make cable. So Cisco really wants you to move up to have higher speeds, to get a new access point that runs faster, but they don't want you to spend that budget on cabling. And that's fine. I don't want to install new cabling either. It's up in the ceiling. It's in the wall. It's a hassle. I've got to lift up all the ceiling tiles to pass new cable. That's going to drop dust on everyone's desk. It's not going to be 
popular, and it doesn't fit with what we've been trying to drive with structured cabling. The magic of structured cabling is I don't need to replace the cabling. I can go faster just hanging a different device on either end. So last year now, uh, 802.3BZ was approved, sometimes referred to as NBASE-T. And what this allows us to do, now here's our story about we're, uh, we're, using, <laughs> we're using higher velocity. No one's using less Wi-Fi, so that's become the bottleneck. So we want to run two and a half and, and five two and a half and five gigabits over regular category 5e and category 6 cable. Now, running the two and a half and five gig, five gigs going to run up there closer to 250 megahertz. We didn't actually test the 5e cabling out to 250 megahertz. We're not sure that it's going to work. So there's actually a standard, the TI-5021, that has the limits going out two higher frequencies so you can be assured that your, your cabling is going to work. But trust me, if you installed to 5e, you tested to 5e, your cabling's still in good shape, it's probably going to work. I've seen some interesting interoperability tests where a switch from one manufacturer, an access point from another manufacturer, network interface card from another manufacturer, they're going to run 2.5 and, and 5 gig. Basically, they're taking a, a 10 gig chipset and they're slowing it down. And slowing it down gives a little bit more time. It speaks a little bit clearly and it can work well. Now, when they're doing this, when they're looking at it, they can look at a single conductor. And within a single conductor, under a single jacket, the network interface card knows what signal it's sending on each one of the four pairs. Now, since it knows what signal it's sending on each one of the four pairs, that makes it easier for the network interface card to determine what interference is coming from one pair under the jacket to another pair under the jacket. And it can, it can remove that. It can almost work, it only can work, in a situation where there's a negative attenuation to crosstalk ratio. Now, where this gets complicated is when there's noise that's coming in from outside of the jacket. For example, two cables running in parallel. When there are multiple cables running in parallel, it's difficult for the network interface card to eliminate the interference that's generated by the adjacent cables. Now, the adjacent cables have always generated interference. They're twisted in a pair, and that twisting in the pair helps to reduce the noise, but still some signal leaks out and it is induced to jump on the other conductors. Now when we've been operating at lower speeds, there's been a much stronger signal, there's been much less attenuation, so the alien crosstalk hasn't been an issue. But now when we're really pushing the speeds up there, what we're finding is that interference from outside the cable starts to be a problem. I've got this great chart here, but before we get to that, let's look more carefully at what is alien crosstalk. So here, each one of these green lines represents a single pair of a cable. So I've got four pairs underneath one jacket in one cable, and I've got four pairs underneath one jacket in an adjacent cable. Now, here's some electrons, and I'm going to send these electrons down the wire. And as they go down the wire, a couple things happen to them. You see we have fewer electrons. We get some insertion loss, some attenuation here, the electrons that we lost on the way. Some of those electrons will reflect back and be measured as return loss. But a few of the electrons, I like to call these the naughty electrons, the adolescent electrons, do what they want, they are induced to jump from one cable onto the other cable. Now, if we measure these interfering signals on the near end, this is what we talk about as being alien next, and they go in both directions. If we measure these on the far end, that would be alien fixed, alien far end crosstalk or alien attenuation to crosstalk ratio far end, kind of a, uh, it's the, the crosstalk, if you will, taking into account what the attenuation is for the signal. So now that we know what that induced signal is, let's take a look at this chart again and see what it's showing us. This chart is talking about three different situations and how much alien limited signal to noise ratio, call that alien next, how much risk there is 
for these different combinations. So here we're looking at very little of the cable distance-wise being bundled tightly together. And 2.5 G-base T, it's actually really robust. It's actually more robust than one gig Ethernet. Shh, don't tell anyone. So that's going to be great. That's going to open up new bandwidth with our existing cabling, everything that structured cabling always promised us. And that should work fine on Category 5E and Category 6. Now, when we go up to 5 gig, when we're going to 250 megahertz with the 5G base T, well, that starts to open up a question with existing 5E cabling because it wasn't tested out to that frequency. And, of course, all of this is going to work just fine on Category 6A cable. Now, if the bundle of the cable is longer, here we're looking at the bundle of the cable going from 50 to 75 meters, start to question 2.5, and, and certainly we're worried about 5 gig where we've got these longer bundles. And what happens with the longer bundle? More time for the signal to be exchanged within the cable, more interference is possible. Also, the signal that we're transmitting is attenuated. It's weakened. It's more susceptible to interference. So when we get out beyond 75 meters of cable in a bundle, we may not probably will not be able to support 5G base T. You've heard me tell the story before about where I've seen alien crosstalk in the interoperability lab, and when they start putting 5 gig on all the disturb repairs, certainly that affects the ability of the victim cable to be able to run at 5 gig. What's going to happen? It'll downshift. Instead of running at 5 gig, maybe it'll run at 2.5, maybe it'll run at 1 gig, maybe it'll run at 100 megabits. You'll still have communication, you just won't be able to reach those higher speeds that you're looking for. So how do we tell if our cabling is, is acceptable to this? Well, as a tester manufacturer, I'll certainly suggest that you go out and you test your cabling <laughs> to make sure that it's going to work. But I know that's a tough sell on people. Well, it's been working for years. Why do I, why do I have to go out and test it again? Well, you're making the investment in the new equipment. If you want to know if it's going to work, try testing it. You can test before you can test after. But another recommendation they're throwing out, this is serious, is eyeball it. Take a look at the cabling and see what you see. So here we have a patch panel, and you see they're taking all those cables and they're starting to wrap them. Good thing you're, they're using Velcro and not cable ties. But to make it extra attractive, they're feeding this bundle of cables into this sheath that has 12 cables in it. And then we'll see that these sheaths are running in the, the ladder rack. And so we can physically look at our cabling, and if we see that our cabling is that beautiful, looks like a lady's combed hair tied off every, uh, every two feet, careful about how long this is running. Because if this is running over a long distance, if this is running over 50 meters in the sheath, yeah, you might have an alien crosstalk issue on your cabling. Of course, if it's loose in the tray, I'm sorry, that's not physically appealing to our eye, but our eye is not an electron, and it's harder for an electron to get induced from one cable to the other if they're not running in parallel for a long distance. So ways that we can reduce the potential for alien crosstalk, unbundle the cables, especially the patch cables. Why the patch cables? Because the signal is strongest when it's just coming out of the network interface card, and the signal coming from the far end is at its weakest and most attenuated. I realize that's difficult for people. You don't want your, your, uh, <laughs> your cabling job to show up on the Internet photo page. Um, only use channels where the lengths are less, less than 50 meters, so we don't have a chance to generate that noise. You may replace some of the components, the 5E and 6 components, with 6A components. You may use 6A patch cords. You may use 6A jacks. That'll reduce the crosstalk and test it. There are actually are standards, the TI-5021, uh, within the latest revision of our firmware. You'll actually see a test for, uh, for 2.5 and 5G base T. All right, enough with... Enough with uh, the end base T. Let's move on to the newer and the faster things. Category 8. Ooh, category 8, it's out there. <laughs> what did happen to Category 7? Eh, story for another day. So we've agreed that no one wants to go slower. Everyone wants to go faster. And maybe people will go to fiber, but maybe some people will use copper. Different designs, different needs, different applications. 
the idea of Category 8, as we see it today, is that it's something that we're going to be using in data centers. Now, part of this is, and the, the big dramatic part of Category 8 is the distance is limited. We can't go 100 meters. We can go to a channel length of 30 meters. A couple of extra meters, depending on the derating, depending on the gauge size of the cable, but it's not going to be 100 meters. Let's call it 30 meters. We're talking about a two-connector channel, not the four-connector channel we're, we're used to. And something interesting, and this may be the killer application for Category 8, is that they're allowing direct attach. Basically, you can have a Category 8 patch cord with two RG45 plugs on it, but that's limited to a length of five meters. Now, why we see this as potentially being the new killer application is we can use this instead of a proprietary QSFP cable, uh, one of the cables with, with twin X that we're using to go from switch to switch. Those cables are stiff, they're expensive, they don't use an RG45 connector, and a regular RG45 connector on a Category 8 patch cord may be a less expensive and more flexible way to go. Now, if it only goes 30 meters, why do we see any hope for this? Well, it's based on our friend, the RG45, the connector we've been using all over the place. It's backwards compatible. I may install a Category 8 cable in my horizontal link, but today I might use a Category 6. I might use a Category 5E patch cord. You can plug a Category 5E patch cord into a Category 8 jack. Now, to get this extra speed out of it, we're going to run to a higher frequency. We're going to run out to 2 gigahertz. Uh, the test limits for Category 8, or ISO 11801 Class 1, are very similar to Category 6A. They've just run out to this higher frequency. Now, the European standard, the ISO 11801, has Class 1, and it, always has and it also has Class 2. Class 2 is based on connectors that are not RJ45. And those are using test limits similar to what the Europeans call Class FA. Talked briefly about Category 7. <laughs> no, there isn't a Category 7, but components of a Class FA link are named Category 7. So you have a Category 7 jack and Category 7 cable. That's always shielded. And again, uh, Class F doesn't run on our regular RJ45. It runs on connectors that have, uh, call it improved performance, because it is actually quite a bit better. Um, alien crosstalk absolutely is going to be required because it's there running at a higher frequency. Now, because we're running at a higher frequency, we're going to use shielded cabling. The shielded cabling is important not only to resist the interference external to the cable, but also we don't want the cable radiating a signal that causes interference. So. Just real briefly, I've been talking about this Class 1 and Class 2. Here we've got the North American TIA, the limits we are familiar with, the 568 standard that we use. Now in Europe, again, they, or the international standard that's recognized by many countries, uh, the 11801, it has two Category 8 specifications, Class 1 and Class 2. All of these run out to 2 megahertz. Now, TIA and ISO 11801 Class 1 are based on RJ45 connectors. This backwards compatibility is fantastic. In spite of the shortcomings of an RJ45, it was designed to run 60 kilohertz telephone service. It is susceptible to a little bit of next in the connector. It's everywhere. Now, some people have come out with some connectors that move the pins around, separate the pins, that reduces the crosstalk within the jacket and does provide some better performance. Challenge being, it's not an RJ45. So if we look at them, uh, Class 1 of ISO 11801 and TI Category 8 are both based on our friend, the RJ45 plug. And Class 2, there are a couple of different uh, types of these connectors. This is uh, an example of the Terra connector here. There's also a GG45 and ARJ45 couple of other ones, and you see by separating the pins, they reduce the noise. By shielding each pair, they reduce the noise. Some great performance, uh, but important that we understand that just because something meets class two does not mean that it meets class one. We can't connect these two connectors together. So. Uh, 
the TI standard for, for Category 8, I, can't, I want to say June, might have been July of last year. It's, it's coming up on having a birthday. But the important standard that was approved was the 1152, the A revision that actually came out. We mentioned 1152 briefly. We're talking about resistance. 1152 defines what we're going to do in the field. What is the accuracy for the test equipment, and what tests are we going to be running? So, uh, yeah, it's going to tell us what tests we shall be running. Now, it's not just 2 gigahertz. We also have uh, next and return loss, and we need to be accurate when we're running next and return loss. We need to be accurate when we're running the insertion loss test. So it's not just saying a frequency, but is the measured value valid? Is it interesting at that frequency? So moving right along, the channel models, there's going to be two. There's going to be a permanent link model, which will go from the patch panel to the telecommunications outlet. The measurement's going to start here at the end of the, of the permanent link adapter. We can go 24 meters. You go, gee, only 24 meters. 24 meters is a good distance from your closet. Might also be interesting to see what starts happening with wireless. And if we don't have wireless access points that they recommend putting within 24 meters of a cabinet, or those wireless access points that are within 24 meters of a cabinet serving to uh, connect at a higher speed. The other option is going to be a channel. Now in the channel, we're going to use that same 24 meters of horizontal. And then we're going to add 2 meters of patch cord on each end to get us up to a total of, no, not 2 meters, 3 meters of patch cord. <laughs> Pardon my math. Didn't I already say it was too early in the morning for math? Anyways, uh, from channel adapter to channel adapter, from the end of the user patch cord, from the end of the user patch cord, we'll have 30 meters. And the mated connection of the plug into the channel adapter will not be included in the measurement. So why only 30 meters? How come we don't send the signal farther? Well, let's take a look at that insertion loss or attenuation parameter. We remember the green line from our earlier slide. This represents a single pair of cable. And we remember the electrons from our earlier slide. So we're going to send this quantity of electrons, this quantity of electrons, we're going to send that down the wire, and fewer electrons show up at the far end. We lose some of them. Now, looking at this graph of insertion loss, we see on the horizontal axis the signal strength, the amount of lost signal going up and to the right. We're losing more signal as I said horizontal axis, right, as I pointed at the DB here, didn't I? Vertical axis vertical axis, on <laughs> the horizontal axis, axis, we're going to be looking at the frequency that we're transmitting at. Now, this red line here is the limit for the standards, and going up and to the right, it's increasing as the frequency increases. So insertion loss increases with frequency. We're going out to a really high frequency, 2 gigahertz, so there's going to be a lot of attenuation. Now, here we're looking at a shorter link. Here's a 20-meter link. And you see we're going to 250 megahertz, so this is a category, a category 6 link. On a longer link, here's a 90 meter link, remember our attenuation, our measured attenuation was down here, but on the longer link we get more attenuation. So increasing frequency, more attenuation, more signal loss. Increasing length, which makes perfect sense, more signal loss. So when we're going out to 2 gigahertz, in order to have a signal that can be interpreted, <laughs> we had to shorten the link. And here we see a 30-meter channel with the attenuation measured. Now, here's our next graph, our near-end crosstalk, the interference from one pair to another pair. On the vertical axis, <laughs> we have the strength of the interference from one pair, the different pair combinations here, from one pair to another. And on the horizontal axis, we've got the frequency. Here's a category 6A going out to 500 megahertz. And you'll see basically what we're doing, kind of using the same limit, limit line. We're just stretching that out to 2 gigahertz. So here's a passing next measurement of category 8 link. All right. Now, I mentioned that shielding is particularly important. And we've taken an important step in our new solution, the, the DSX 5000 and the DSX 8000. Yes, we're sad to see the DTX 1800 going out of service. It was discontinued two years ago. 
I'm sorry we're running out of parts for it. But, uh, much as I would like the European Union to continue to accept lead and cadmium and the electronic components that are made, they've decided they don't want it. And when that big of a buyer gets out of the market, yeah, it's technology. Things move on. So we're sad to lose the 1800. Great product, tough as hell, lasted forever. Too long, if you ask some of us. But <laughs> no. But there are some challenges with the DTX. And one of the challenges is how we measure the continuity of the shield. The DTX does a fairly simple measurement. It looks for conductivity on the shield connector. And if it sees a low resistance path on the shield conductor, it says, well, we've got continuity here. On the new DSX platform, we looked very carefully at the shield to make sure. I, When I first heard this, I couldn't believe it, but it turns out that the standard doesn't require that you measure if the shield follows the path of the cabling. So it's, yes, been updated for Category 8, and they say that the test, we need to look and see if the shield follows the path of the cabling. Why do we do that? We want to make sure that there's not a conductive link between the shield conductors. We want to make sure the shield is effective. So the DSX does a much better job of measuring, does the shield follow the path of the cabling? Let's make sure that that shield is effective. Now, what's the importance of this shield? Here we're taking a look at, yes, alien crosstalk measurements for Category 8. So this alien crosstalk is running out to 2 gigahertz. And with the shield properly terminated, all the measured value, and this is interesting, the first almost gigahertz of the, of the measured value is just noise. There's barely anything coming through. It's only after about a gigahertz that we start to see. It gets challenging up here at a gigahertz and a half gets challenging and we start to get noise coupled from one cable to another cable. But with the shield properly terminated, we're all above the line. There's not any noise interfering there. Now, if the shield is not properly terminated, that can allow the signal to leak out. And here we see a failing result where the shield wasn't properly terminated and too much signal got coupled from one cable to the next cable. Hey, so there we go. We're running our test, and here is a Category 8 channel test. It's passing. Run out to 2 gigahertz. We are ready to move on. All right, so just to summarize, Category 8 was approved July. Okay, almost coming up on uh, one year ago. But the, the 568 standard, the components, the pieces, parts that we're using was approved. 1152, the standard that tells us what we have to measure in the field and how accurately we have to measure. It doesn't do anything to run out to a high frequency if there's no accuracy in your test results. That doesn't interest me. Uh, yeah, we did work on the standard that defines what the accuracy is. We have accuracy 2E for category 5E, accuracy level 3 for category 6, accuracy level 3E for category 6A. Now, I've left out accuracy level 4 and level 5 because accuracy level 4 and level 5 apply to the ISO standards that um, class F and class FA cabling. Um, for the sake of clarity, we've gone to level 2G accuracy to cover the category 8 testing. Uh, it's based on an RG45. Again, super important, that backwards compatibility. And I know there's not that much product out there in the market. There are absolutely a couple manufacturers, some people making cable, a couple people making field installable plugs. But it's coming. We'll get there ready to field test this. Now, before we wind up the presentation, something to offer you, and it's how to be more efficient and how to make more money in the work that you're doing. When we've observed how people are working, how people are doing their testing, what we found is configuring the tester is pretty straightforward. I'm going to set it for CAT5 or CAT6, permanent link, channel, run my test. Great. People understand how to do that. They do it all day long. The challenge comes in how I get the test results from the tester to the customer. And looking at how people deliver the test results, it's not that it's hard to get the test results out of the tester. It's easy. Plug in your USB cable, run it to your laptop. I don't have a laptop. Hmm. I hadn't thought of you not bringing a laptop to the job site. Or I don't have admin rights for the laptop, and the tester has the new firmware, and the new firmware won't run with the old version of Linkware that I have on my laptop, and I don't have admin rights to upgrade it, so I can't download the test results. 
Interesting. I can put it on a USB stick, but then I physically have to transfer the USB stick somewhere. So we looked at that and we said, well, what if we used a cloud service where we could, and let's look at a complete use of this. One of the simple things we can do with the cloud service is send test results to the cloud. That works great for us, and that might actually be making money for people. So I was at a trade show last week, and I heard a good story. The guy says, yeah, I've got a team, and they're working. I forget. I want to say it was North Texas, Oklahoma, and he'll send his team out in the van. They'll be on the road a week, maybe even two weeks, stopping at a bunch of little job sites, running a bunch of little tests, some moves, adds, and changes, a uh, new bank branch that's going up that's got 20 drops in it, and they'll run those tests. Now, I'm not going to send those guys out there with a laptop. For God's sakes, I already gave them a truck and a tester. I put a shirt on their back. Now they want a laptop from me? Get your own damn laptop. So they've got those test results. Now those customers are going to pay me as the owner of the company when I deliver them test results. Now, what's better, getting paid today or getting paid in two weeks when the people come back to the office with the tester? While you're thinking about the answer to that question, well, I'd rather get paid today. So what this guy's done is he's trained his people, and this is a little bit the challenging part, the adoption, trained his people that at the end of the day, upload the test results. So same day that the tests are run, we can deliver them to the customer. The customer's happy because he knows his cable is ready to run. Owner of the company's happy because he's getting paid sooner. Cash flow, I think the MBAs call that. Uh, let's look at this in a little bit of detail. Now that's the simplest model where we just send test results to the cloud, but let's make this model more complete. There's a project manager who has the bid document in front of him. He knows what the cabling requirements are, especially when we talk about fiber and custom limits. He probably has all the cable IDs with him. He can take that information and send it up to the cloud. Now the technician, when he gets to the job site, connects the tester to the cloud to link where live and imports that configuration and imports the cable IDs. Then he spends his time running his tests End of the day, heck, end of the morning. You don't have. You can do this multiple times during the day. He's going to have his test results finished, and he will send those test results to the cloud. We have not only are thousands of companies doing this work, but we have more than five million test results that have been sent up to the cloud. This is really happening. People are really using this. So. Once the test results are in the cloud, lots of people can get to it. The project manager can check either on his laptop or on his phone. The uh, manufacturer who's going to be issuing the, the warranty can make sure that it's being done. The end user. I think it is kind of like the uh, airway bill. Hey, did you ship me that package yet? Oh, yeah, yeah, I shipped it. Oh, great, what's the airway bill number? Oh, yeah, it's a 1Z um, something. Let me get that for you. Hey getting done with the job, show me the test results. More and more will come out of this ability to leverage the test results. But immediately today, we're seeing increased efficiency, people getting the results faster, people getting access to the test results faster, and more and more of that is going to be coming. So well, summarizing, trying to finish the top of the hour here, we have the new link definition, MPTL, Modular Plug Terminated Link. Yep, if you are installing a device up high in the corner that's only going to be a camera, it's only going to be an access point, you don't need to do administration, it's an awkward place to put a faceplate, you might be able to plug a jack on that. Now this doesn't mean that you have freedom to always install a jack and never use faceplates again. No, when you're doing structured cabling, you really want to use a faceplate. When you're running power, or you know you're going to, be going to be running power over a link, you really want to take a look at those resistance values, the loop resistance and the resistance unbalance, to make sure that the PoE is going to be well supported. Talked about n T, the existing 5E cabling and Category 6 cabling. Hey, good thing you installed Category 6, a little bit of extra margin. You'll run 5G based T with no problem. They may require additional tests if your cables are in a bundle and running in a bundle for a long distance. Alien crosstalk might really be kicking in there, so make sure you at least eyeball them, and better, test it again to make sure that it's going to run. Category 8 has been approved. It's been approved a year ago. Uh, first products are starting to get out there. More and more, I think we're going to start to see a couple of Category 8 projects coming in. 
And finally, Linkware Live. If you have a Linkware Live account, try it. It is free, linkwarelive.com. Sign up now, open an account on a web page. This is a web-based service. And once you have your account set up, then you can connect your Versive tester to the internet, send the test results up there, leverage those efficiencies. I think we have a couple questions here. So let me dive into that. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and send them uh, over our chat window here. All right, fiber products question. And a question about using Category 7A cable with a Category 6A jack. Well, Category 7A cable would be a shielded cable, so probably want to make sure you're using shielded jacks to make sure you're, you're terminating that. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but it would be difficult to get Class FA link performance using an RJ45 connector. That, uh, that uh, performance isn't going to be quite there. All right. And here is a question. We'll uh, be moving on to that. Wasn't the intention to talk today. There's a question here about 400 gigabits, multi-mode, single mode. Um, I, I will say one thing about fiber. What we're seeing is a transition in fibers. Where in the past we've had a single fiber or a single color that we can transmit 10 gigabits on. Moving forward, we're going to get more efficient at the coding, if you will, of the data that we put on the fiber. And where we used to get 10 gigabits on a single color or a single link of fiber, now we're going to be able to get 25. So you'll be able to get on a MPO cable, where we used to use four pairs to transmit 40 gig, I might be able to transmit that either on a single pair or if each one of those four cables can now transmit 100 gig, because I'll do four colors, 25 gig per color will give me 100 gig per fiber, and I've got my MPO or MTP connectors transmitting four cables, transmitting 100 gig each, I'll be able to transmit a lot, <laughs> 400 gig coming and going. Uh, now, a further question asking about 16 or 32 fibers. And heck, let's ask about 72 fibers. <laughs> Those MPO connectors can have multiple rows of either 12 or 16 fibers. Today, if you are using a uh, multiple of 12 or a multiple of 16, we need to we need to, at this moment, our MPO connector does have a 12 fiber, our MPO, our tester that has an MPO port on it uh, is designed to test 12 fibers, so you would have to use a Y cable. I've got a couple of customers who have done 24 fibers with it, so they have a Y cable that has a 24 fiber MPO on one end going to two 12s. Okay, and here, hey, a question about copper, thank you. <laughs> uh, has QWERTY Category 8 been approved by the IEEE? Now, uh, the application people aren't going to be looking at Category 8. What the application people, the IEEE, the 802.3 people are going to be looking at is the transmission that we're going to be sending. And yes, they have approved 25 and 40 gig Ethernet that will run over Category 8. It's the cabling standards, the TIA and the ISO that talk about the cabling. So um, yes, uh, the ISO, actually ISO has not yet ratified class one and class two. That's coming. We know what the numbers are going to be. We expect that to be ratified in the, in the fall this year. But TIA has, uh, has ratified, uh, has approved, has published category eight. IEEE will be talking about the, um, the 25 and 40 gig transmissions. Let's see what else we have coming down here. Um, can we download this presentation? Yeah, I'm sure we're going to make a copy of this available for everyone. Uh, OM5. All right, next presentation will be on fiber. <laughs> this time we're going to stick to we're going to stick to copper. But I can't resist an OM5 question. With OM5, which is the new wideband multimode fiber, it specifies not only a loss value for working at 850 nanometers. Uh, and 1300 nanometers, but it also has a loss value for 953 nanometers. 
So the question is, if I have a loss value for 953 nanometers, do I need to buy a new light source and power meter to measure this new window? Well, I got good news and bad news for you. Good news is, because we're testing at 850 and 1300, they're not exactly linear, but because they bookend or they bracket the 953 wavelength, if we're passing at 850 and we're passing at 1300, 953 is going to be fine. So the good news, you don't have to get a new light source and a power meter to test OM5. The bad news is my company makes light sources and power meters. So yes, <laughs> you will absolutely have to get something special for that. All right, so some people are pointing out that no, we're not doing 25 gig on a single fiber and a single color today. I know that, I know that, but we'll get to that. Um, if you have a connector that passed gigabit ethernet, does that guarantee that it passes 2.5 and 5 gig ethernet? No, it doesn't. Um, that's why we test to category 5E and category 6 as opposed to testing to the application limits. The application limits for gigabit ethernet, gigabit ethernet only runs at 80 megahertz. So if you test to the application, that doesn't give you the assurance that future applications will be supported. That's why we want to test to 5E and test to uh, category 6 or 6A. Now 5E um, certainly has the ability, I've seen it running two and a half, and 5 gig ethernet. So please, in the copper world, we want to test to the cabling standard, not the application standards. All right, I think that is going to wrap up our questions. A uh, little bit more than an hour here, sorry to take up that extra time. Thank you very much for your, your patience in sitting through this today. Hope everyone's enjoyed it. Again, my name is Jim Davis. I work here at Fluke Networks. And uh, have a good day, everyone.